with that, I'm going to pass things along to Abigail Boyer. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, Amy. And thank you all and that's for this webinar. As um, Amy mentioned, this is National Campus Safety Awareness Month, and one of our favorite things to do at the Cleary Center is to be able to provide these learning opportunities throughout the length of September, and certainly they'll also be made available after the month. Um, as we're doing our introductions, we'd encourage you all to do introductions as well. So in that chat box so that we can all get comfortable with it. If you're comfortable, please go ahead and share your name and your institution. I think one of the things that we often find valuable within these shared spaces is learning not only from our presenters but from one another as well. Um, so getting a sense of who's in the room will um, certainly help us all with that. Um, so before we dive too much into content, I want to give you a sense of who your presenters are today and, and what we're going to be learning. Um, so I want to start out just by thanking, as, as Amy did, our sponsor, Code Blue, and create a space for um, Michael Z Z Zydema, I apologize, Michael, um, and he will share the correct pronunciation of his last name, um, just to share a little bit about himself um, within the space. So, Michael, um, welcome. Thanks, Abby. And for anybody wondering, it's pronounced Zydema. It's a wacky Dutch name where they throw a U in where it's unnecessary. So no worries there. Uh, good day, everyone. I just wanted to take a few moments to thank everyone for attending uh, what should definitely be a beneficial and informative webinar. Um, in recent years, Code Blue has been proud to help support the Cleary Center and National Campus Safety Awareness Month. Um, because their mission hews very closely to our own, which is creating safer campuses. Um, it's what Code Blue strives to do with our emergency communication solutions, and it's certainly what the Cleary Center is working for as well. Um, and with that, I'll make sure to turn it over to the people you actually came to hear, uh, Abigail and Laura. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. So we'll just share a little bit about ourselves. Um, my name is Abigail Boyer. I am the Associate Executive Director of Programs here at the Cleary Center. Um, and myself and colleagues uh, here really are the lead for developing a number of different programs and resources that you all might be utilizing, um, just one of which is National Campus Safety Awareness Month. I want to open the floor for my colleague, Laura, Hello. to introduce herself as well, because we're going to be the Hello. leads for addressing some of these common questions and concerns today. Um, so Laura, would you mind just doing a quick intro? Sure. Thanks so much, Abby. Uh, yes, I am Laura Egan. I am the Senior Director of Training and Technical Assistance at the Cleary Center, and I've been with the Cleary Center for about two years. And prior to that, had about five years of experience working on a campus in both student conduct and residence life. And I'm really excited to join Abby today to share with you all, hopefully, some answers to commonly asked questions around implementing the Cleary Act. Thanks, Abby. Thank you, Laura. So we always like to start any of our efforts by reminding ourselves and, and all of us of um, the reason that we do this work. And here at the Cleary Center, one of those primary reasons is certainly in, in honor of Jean Cleary, who you see on the screen. Um, her parents, Connie and Howard Cleary, were our founders. And they ultimately, um, after Jean's death in April of 1986, did what they could um, to create safer spaces on campus. And, and one of um, the things that they work towards that they're best known for is certainly the Gene Cleary Act, which we're going to be talking about today. Um, so Connie and Howard really did work to make campuses safer, and that is ultimately the mission of the Cleary Center. And the way that we do that work is in working with all of you, working with colleges and universities through a number of different um, mechanisms um, and options that we have available. Just one of those is our membership program. It's a team-based program that brings together, really packages all of the services, expertise, and resources that we have to offer. You're going to hear that team-based approach kind of threading through all of the work that we do. And one of the reasons for that is with all of the years that we've spent training colleges and universities, one of the things that we think is critical to that is really building a multidisciplinary approach. So as we talk about these requirements, you're going to notice that they don't just fall in one department. They can't um, just fall in one individual. So if you are one of those um, folks that's feeling like a lone soldier on your campus, we hope that some of the resources that we share throughout this webinar will um, be those that you can take back to your campus and use as an argument for why you need more support in this area. And we as an organization are here to help you with that as well. Um, in addition to our membership program, we also have um, trainings and additional webinars 
many, especially throughout National Campus Safety Awareness Month. And since you're in this webinar, hopefully you are connecting um, and promoting the month already. But just as a reminder, the theme for this year is take the first step. And the reason that we did that is we were getting a lot of feedback from institutions that were saying, you know, we want to build policies, we want to build programs. We're doing a lot of um, work on our campus, but we're having trouble really figuring out where to start. So all of our webinars, our resources for this year are really created with that in mind. How do you take the first step? So we know that we can't accomplish all of our goals overnight. Um, we know that that can't always be realistic, but what we can do is set reasonable goals for things that we might want to change, programs that we might want to grow or expand, and the work that we want to do on campus. So although this particular webinar is focused on taking the first step and addressing some of those common challenges related to Cleary, know that that concept really does extend to all of those areas related to campus safety, that it's a matter of figuring out where's your first step and how do you build and grow from there. So with that in mind, I'm going to hand it over to Laura, who's going to um, set the framework for what we're hoping to accomplish with today's webinar, and then we'll dive into the content. So Laura, you can take it over from here. Great. Thanks so much, Abby, and thanks for that well-rounded explanation of NACSAM this year. It's so exciting to see all of these things come to fruition after our months of planning. So today, what we're really focusing on is tackling some of the larger questions or common areas of confusion around implementing and complying with the Clery Act. So we've composed uh, some of the most commonly asked questions that we receive as we conduct trainings throughout the year. As you'll see, that's the way the content is structured today. But we will leave room as well to answer questions that you all might have as they come up throughout the webinar and then at the end of the webinar as well. So you'll see that we've broken up the topic areas by um, subjects and such as CSAs, talking through geography, counting and classifying, as well as alerting, and then the Violence Against Women Act. So we will tackle some questions within those sections, but please know that you can also ask your own questions either throughout or hold them till the end of the entire um, set of slides, whatever you prefer. As there are many individuals on this webinar, we will do our best to address all of those questions, but please know if we do not tackle something in real time that we will follow up with you as well to get you an answer that is helpful. So additionally today, we will also provide some examples of promising practices in the field of campus safety and how, especially how they relate to each of these topic areas. And so a couple of things that we'll be providing you with during today's webinar are some resources that are helpful in implementing um, some of the Clery Act requirements in each of these areas. We've also developed a document that we were even surprised to realize we didn't already have to give everybody, but it is something that we're calling our Fast Facts document. It was intended to be a one-pager because we know that's such a magical number of pages, but it is actually a three-pager if you would uh, print it out uh, front and back. So we apologize for that being two pieces of paper as opposed to one. But it is a comprehensive document that touches on the overall aspects of complying with the Clery Act and is intended to be a document that you can share with your campus community to give folks that might not intersect with this work as often some ideas as to how the Clery Act influences their day-to-day -day campus work as a campus community member. So we hope that that is a useful tool for you all to use. You'll see that document in the files pod on the platform that you're looking at on your screen. And then additionally in that area, there are a bunch of other resources that are specific to each of these topic areas that we'll go through today that we'll reference. And so they're right there for your convenience, um, and we'll make sure to reinforce them throughout the training as we come to them. In addition to your ability to ask questions throughout the webinar today, we will also be asking questions of you. And asking for you to respond to them through that chat box that you're all using to introduce yourselves right now. So please do take advantage of that when we do offer those opportunities. As Abby said earlier, we really do learn best from each other, particularly as there is no one way to implement the Clery Act as each campus is unique and specific. So please uh, do take advantage of those opportunities to chat with us and each other in response to both chat box questions and polls that we'll be facilitating. So speaking of polls, we'll do our first one right now to get an even further um, idea of who is joining us in today's webinar. Thank you so much for all of you that are already sharing your names and um, institutions. We'd also love to know a little bit more about the role that you are playing at your institution. 
So if you could answer the poll for us by just providing the letter number, uh, sorry, you'll be able to select the choice as it pops up in your screen. I actually do see that a message is coming up on my computer right now that Adobe Connect has possibly stopped working for some folks, so there might be a pause in the sound. If that is not the case, then great, and we will just wait for this poll to be launched by our folks on the back end, but there might be a slight delay if there has been a pause in Adobe itself. So we can just hold on for one second and see what we can do to best facilitate what's going to happen now with Adobe. Laura. Presenters, can you still hear me? Yeah. Hi, Laura, can you? Oh, you can hear me? This is Amy. Yes, I see that the program is maybe frozen. Is that for everybody or just for me? It may be just for you. Do you want to try to relaunch it? Um, we're seeing, sure. I'm not seeing any comments from anyone. Let us know, folks, if you, if you aren't seeing it. But for us, the poll is still live, um, so we're happy to okay. even relay some of the numbers if you'd like us to do that while you're waiting to relaunch. Well, that would be great. And I'll actually talk this to Abby because she's going to talk through the next section sure. of CSAs while I yeah. relaunch. And thank you, um, audience, for your patience while I navigate this. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Great. So as we're looking, it looks like a couple of folks are still um, answering the poll, but we do have a good mixture that we're seeing already. Um, so a number of folks that have, play a role in Title IX, um, a good significant um, amount in campus police or security, um, human resources. We do have quite a few that put themselves in the other category. Um, so if you did and you'd be willing to go ahead and share in the chat um, what, what role you play on campus that's outside of those listed, that's really helpful so we get a sense of um, what the different roles are in the room. I also appreciate that for some of you, if you were having poll challenges or even if not, I'm seeing a couple of you just um, taking to the chat box and sharing what your uh, role is on the campus in that space, so that's a really good alternative as well. So we'll go ahead and close the poll so that we can move on um, with the session. But I think it helps to give us a sense, um, one, of who's in the space, but I think it also helps us to reinforce that when it does come to Clery compliance and Clery work, notice it's this, the intersection of all of these roles that really help us um, build systems on campus that um, can really help support the work that we do. So certainly if we're here, we imagine that you probably play some role with Clery, but we like to start with just a general refresher. We're going to be doing kind of a more of a deep dive into some of these areas um, as we address these questions. The questions that we're going through today are not the be all and end all of questions that we get um, related to Clery, especially because we do provide technical assistance to the community in this area. Um, so really the, the scope of what we see and hear at the Clery Center really varies on the needs of specific campuses. That said though, we did focus this year on some of the trends that we've been hearing most often in the past couple of months. Um, for those of you who have participated in National Campus Safety Awareness Month before, you know that we did some similar webinars last September and some of the common questions then are different than what we're looking at now. Um, so I think it just reinforces that we often do see some trends in maybe some of the roadblocks that institutions are running into or things that they're re-exploring as new guidance um, comes out. We just had an updated handbook for campus safety and security reporting last summer. So as institutions were revisiting their own policies and procedures, that certainly influenced maybe some of the questions that were coming up for them. But when we're thinking about the Clery Act, um, if we look at the who, where, what, and how, um, the who is the campus security authorities and local law enforcement. When we're thinking about where our statistics specifically are coming from, but certainly this also intersects with some of the policy information that we share within um, uh, our annual security report, that information is coming from a number of different parties on the campus who play trusted roles that individuals might go to to make a report. And we're going to talk about the role of campus security authorities again in just a moment. Where is Clery Act geography? So the Clery Act does um, utilize specific geography, certain boundaries that the, uh, for which the institution reports. So some of the questions that we're going to talk about today do focus on the different um, types of geography that are, are available and some of the um, current concerns that we're hearing from institutions, or some of them are really just areas of clarification. So maybe not necessarily a problem that you're running into on campus, but something that you want to make sure that you know and understand. 
And then the what and how are really ongoing efforts that we implement every single day at our institutions. So although you have an annual security report that you release to your students and employees and share with your prospective students and employees, um, many of you are working on deadlines for that now because you must release it by October 1st. That's one annual obligation that's your opportunity to make sure that you have all of these um, existing policies and procedures in place on your campus, as well as to make sure that you're collecting statistics. But much of the work that you do with the CLEARY Act really is on an ongoing basis. So receiving reports from members of your community, determining what you need to do with that information, whether you need to send out an alert to notify members of your community if there's some kind of a risk to them, um, including information in a daily crime log that lists crimes that are reported within your jurisdiction, as well as rights and um, options that you provide to survivors of sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking, among other things. So we really talk about Cleary as that ongoing role um, that the law plays in your prevention and response to campus crime. And then in terms of enforcement, we always like to be clear that the United States Department of Education, specifically the Cleary Act compliance team, enforces the Cleary Act. So we the Cleary Center are not the enforcement authority, but we do provide technical assistance to institutions so that as they're navigating these questions, um, we can support as much as we can. We also sometimes will refer to um, an entity called Westat, who's a federal contractor for the Department of Education. Um, and some of the reason for that is because they're contracted on behalf of the Department of Education um, to run a help desk and also to support your submission of your statistics, um, there are times in which there might be a campus-specific question that is best suited to go to the um, to Westat or to directly to the Department of Education to make sure that you're able to document their response. So we're going to talk about common patterns. We're going to talk about what we know of the guidance. Um, but we just want to make sure that you're aware of those other resources as well, because sometimes those are necessary to get your questions answered. So for campus security authorities, let's just uh, do a quick review of the role of CSAs on our campus. So campus security authorities, although the term um, says security in it, we know that it's a lot broader than just those individuals within campus police and security. Your campus security authorities are the individuals under the Clery Act that are required to report if someone discloses to them that they were a victim of one of those specific Clery Act crimes. Um, and the reason why we see this broader category of people that are required to report is that not everyone ne is necessarily going to be comfortable going directly to campus police or security, but there are other roles on the campus that are likely to know that these incidents are occurring. So it helps us as an institution um, know uh, and be aware of all of the different crimes that might be impacting our campus community. It also helps to streamline information so that regardless of where the information is coming in, that individual has access to the rights and resources and options available within the community. So in addition to campus police and security, there's also those individuals to whom the um, campus uh, directs crime reports to within their policies. So if institutional policies say to report crimes to um, XYZ department, that would make those individuals within that department or within those roles campus security authorities. It would also include those that um, perform security um, duties or roles that are not a part of campus police um, or security. So there might be people who are providing um, security functions like um, an access monitor um, or an RA even that aren't within campus police or security but are providing that security function. And then lastly, there are officials with significant responsibility for student and campus activities. So that's where our scope of CSAs really broadens um, beyond some of just those core roles to really capture those individuals that are likely to be receiving reports through a different lens uh, because we know that someone may be more likely to disclose or share um, an incident that happened to them with their coach or that resident assistant or someone else in student affairs, um, just to name a few examples. Um, so the role of campus security authorities is not to investigate. Um, the, the general CSA is not going to perform that function 
but what they are required to do is to share that non-personally identifiable information with the campus crime collection body. And we use that terminology because Cleary doesn't dictate what individual department collects this information, um, but what you as an institution would need to do is to determine what that crime collection body is so for many institutions, it might be campus police or security. There could be a Cleary coordinator. Um, it really depends on the institution itself as to where that information must be reported. And those CSAs must include that non-personally identifiable information. So the nature of the report, so what type of incident occurred, the date and time that it was reported, the date and time that it occurred itself, as well as the location of that incident. And we're going to be talking about the role of Cleary Geography um, a bit further during the webinar. Um, so it's really important, too, to remember that that doesn't mean that campus security authorities might not share information beyond just the, that minimum um, requirement, especially because sometimes that information will be coming to a CSA that, although they're trusted within the community, they might just not be the best resource for the person that's choosing to report to them. Um, there might be other people that are more regularly responding to these types of incidents that um, are extremely knowledgeable about what the institution can do to help support. So that's another reason why we have these CSAs, to create this network of um, roles and information that's coming into the institution. So one of the most common questions as we start to tackle some of the, the common things that we're seeing at the Cleary Center, I would say one of the um, number one questions that we are hearing right now is in relation to this addition of victim advocates, ombudsperson, directors of counseling and health centers being explicitly listed as examples of campus security authorities within the handbook for campus safety and security reporting. And one of these, um, one of the areas of concerns that we've been hearing is if I'm in my role, let's use victim advocate as an example. If I'm in my role of, as a victim advocate, I'm trying to develop trust and be, um, be that trusted resource on the campus. So how do I meet the obligation of my role while also performing this function of a CSA? And I think it's a really important question because often if campus security authorities have their own kind of cautiousness around their role or fears around their role, um, they could unknowingly um, translate that into who's reporting to them. So we want to make sure that all of our campus security authorities understand what the expectation is of them um, and also what that means for the role and the function that they're, they're playing. So the first step would be, one, to make sure that these individuals know that they're campus security authorities, certainly, but also give them the tools to explain that to the individual that they're working with, what the expectation is, um, and what that means for, for the person reporting or for the person sharing that information. So for example, that advocate could make sure that the person knows that um, as a campus security authority, I am required to share some limited information with other parties on campus. That does not mean identifiable information, so I'm not going to share your name unless you would like me to, um, but I am going to share some details um, of the incident. And the reason for that is so that our campus can make sure that you're receiving um, the, the rights and resources that are afforded to you, as well as we as an institution are able to examine um, any other safety precautions or considerations that we would need to make for the larger community as, at whole, as a whole. Um, so give them some of the um, resources um, or language that they can use to explain that. And talk about, let's give, make sure that they're um, trained or knowledgeable about the function of CSAs. Um, so again, um, creating that network, creating um, this um, organized mechanism of information sharing within the institution. Um, one of the biggest reasons that we've been hearing this come up is less about the role of a CSA and more around concerns um, regarding timely warnings. We're going to be talking about timely warnings um, more throughout the course of this webinar. Um, so some of the fears are, well, I'm worried if I'm an advocate or I'm worried if I'm an ombuds or whatever the case may be, that if I share this information as a CSA and it results in a timely warning that that's going to mean that that person no longer trusts that I'm a resource that they can go to um, for support. And I think that that fear or that question is an important conversation to have on the campus. 
So it doesn't inform whether or not the person has to act as a CSA, but it does inform how they explain the function of a timely warning, and it may inform the institution's timely warning practices as a whole. Um, so making sure that that, inst that individual is able to talk about um, the possibility of a timely warning when the information is being shared, um, because that the person reporting might have um, specific information or feedback that they can offer to help make sure that their identifiable information is not captured in that timely warning. Um, there might be details specific to them as an individual that you wouldn't always necessarily think of as identifiable, but that feel identifiable to them. Um, so it would create a space to have the conversation in advance and to make sure that nothing in your timely warning policies um, are really creating a barrier to this information sharing. So for example, some institutions have timely warning policies where they must issue a timely warning for every Cleary Act crime that occurs within their Cleary geography. That's not what the law is asking for. It's asking for a case-by-case -case analysis, which Laura is going to talk about a little bit later. Um, so this may lead to a broader conversation on your campus regarding what are your timely warning practices and how does that relate to this campus security authority role. Um, so with that in mind, we do want to reinforce that we have a resource um, about the role of victim advocates in particular as CSAs, although I think it can translate to some of these other more sensitive roles, CSA roles as well. And it's on changingourcampus.org. Um, the Cleary Center functions as a technical assistance provider through the Office on Violence Against Women Campus Grant Program. So that was a resource that we developed not only just for grantees of that program, but certainly um, beyond the program as well, that can help frame this issue for individuals that are functioning as a victim advocate. Um, that's also a campus security authority and takes into account the guidance that we, we know thus far from the Department of Education in that area. Laura, is there anything that you would add to that before I um, move on to some of the best ways to train CSAs? No, I would just highlight that um, that this is an area of the Clery um, fast facts document as well that we've included. It's like a high-level overview of who CSAs are. So that is one section of that document that you can use as well to explain the Clery Act to your greater campus community. Great. And I think that also takes us right into the best ways to train CSAs. Um, so we should be clear that nothing in the Clery Act technically requires CSA training. Um, that said, we as an organization would find it difficult to have CSAs that are prepared for their role and understand their role um, without a really intentional process for informing campus security authorities of their role and um, ideally training them on it. So a lot of times institutions will reach out and say, you know, as we're exploring training, what are some of the best ways to do that on our campus? Um, so you certainly are going to have to consider the specifics of your institution. You know, is that an in-person training? Is that an online training? Um, what is the purpose or function of the training that you're providing? But we always start with, with these three um, elements. So one, know the role, making sure that when they leave, whatever format of training you're providing, that they know what a campus security authority is and why they um, function as a campus security authority. Knowing the why is really important because um, although some of us may be personalities where if somebody tells us what to do, if something's mandated, that's enough for us to um, kind of listen and, and do what we're supposed to. But for many of us as adults, we really want to um, understand the purpose. And for us, that purpose goes beyond a federal law says that you are a campus security authority. Um, for the Cleary Center, we look at that purpose as exactly what we've been talking about, um, recognizing that individuals beyond just campus police and security are going to be trusted resources that people are likely to report to and building that web of support at your institution. So thinking about how you're framing that um, and also, and perhaps most importantly, knowing the how. So if I am a campus security authority on your campus, what does that mean in terms of actually reporting? reporting? How do I get that information to the individual or department um, that I need to use? Is there a reporting form? Um, do I pick up the phone and do I call someone? And any training that you provide that can integrate some examples of this, doing case studies, um, utilizing the form as you practice, um, responding to a case study. All of those are going to help better prepare your community for functioning as CSAs. So there are a number of free resources that we can point you to as you are making this determination for yourself. I think the, the um, 
handout that Laura was just referencing that we have attached here is one resource that you can use to help explain the function of CSAs and really the goals of the Clery Act as a whole. Um, we also have sample training slides on the National Campus Safety Awareness Month website that include some talking points. So if you're looking at a starting space of um, we are going to do some in-person training, what might that look like for our institution, you can do that. Um, we have a couple of different video options. So on our website, this is a paid resource, but we have a campus security authority video that's targeted more broadly beyond just campus police or security to those other CSAs within your community, especially those um, that might be student CSAs that are reporting. But then there's also a free resource um, as part of this year's National Campus Safety Awareness Month. We partnered with Allied Universal to create some roll call training videos for public safety officers. So if you're looking at CSA training specific to public safety, that's a good free resource. It's a short five-minute video that you can utilize to help explain that role. Um, and that's you can link to or access those information, that information through the National Campus Safety Awareness Month website as well. So there's a, a few free resources available within your uh, within the um, community that might help you as you're figuring out what that training should look like for you. So then I'm going to hand it over to Laura, who's going to address Cleary geography. Great, thanks so much, Abby. So. In the spirit of the format of our webinar today, we want to give you some brief fast facts regarding Cleary Geography to make sure that we're all on the same page moving forward. So Cleary Geography in general are specified parts of your campus buildings or property as defined under the Cleary Act. And they are important to know because when you are, you are reporting on Cleary Act statistics, you're really only concerned about the Cleary Act crimes that are reported to occur within your Cleary Geography. So it's important to know what parts of your campus fall into each of these categories, both from a compliance perspective and also just from a spirit of the law perspective, so that you know what areas you are communicating to your campus are actually part of your institution in terms of Clery Act responsibility. And you're also ensuring that you're making connections with the local law enforcement and campus security authorities at each of those locations so that you can ensure that you are getting the most robust amount of information when you're collecting crime statistics information from those areas. So when we're talking about Cleary geography, we are talking about on-campus property, which includes your on-campus student housing. We're talking about public property and then non-campus property. So your on-campus property is probably the most straightforward category. It is what your institution thinks of as its core campus, that main area that everybody refers to as your main campus or your core campus. Um, and that just refers to, the, to it that way, but it functions that way. It functions as the main area that comprises the core of your campus. On-campus student housing is housing that is used for students that is located on your on-campus property. So on-campus is a general category, an umbrella, and on-campus student housing is a subset, a, a branch or a part of that on-campus overall category. Your public property is public property that is immediately within or adjacent to your on-campus property and extends as far as the sidewalk street and then sidewalk on the other side of the street when we're talking about that border to your core campus. Your non-campus property is any property that your institution owns or controls that is not reasonably contiguous to your on-campus property. When we say reasonably contiguous, up until June of 2016, there was not a hard and fast definition for what was meant by that. But the Department of Education did provide some clarification that they would consider anything within one mile of the borders of your on-campus property to be considered to be reasonably contiguous to your on-campus property. And we're going to talk a little bit more through that one mile language in a couple of slides. Um, and then just in general, things to take into consideration when you are talking about Cleary geography, um, again, due to the most recent edition of the handbook, are your off-campus trips and your study abroad locations, as there are some particular factors to take into consideration when making classifications for those types of campus property. So as an example of one question we've been getting a lot the past year is, you know, what does this one mile rule really mean? So as I just described a couple moments ago, that one mile rule is in reference to the Department of Education defining what they consider to be reasonably contiguous 
and they say that anything within one mile of the borders of your campus, your core campus, could be considered, could be considered to be reasonably contiguous, meaning it should be captured within your campus's on-campus property. So some, there might be some confusion here because when you're taking into account your public property, there is language that says specifically that if you have a park, a public park or a public waterway that immediately borders your core campus, you are only to count one mile into that public park or public waterway for purposes of counting that property within your Cleary geography. So that is separate and distinct from what is meant by the one mile rule as it pertains to reasonably contiguous. So they're two separate things. But that is a true thing, that if your campus, your core campus, borders a public park or a public waterway, you are only going into that area one mile in terms of including incidents that occur within that one mile within your query statistics. The reasonably contiguous one mile definition, it is really important to pay attention to the language that is included in the handbook in reference to this quote unquote rule, because as a rule, it really is defined more as a guideline in that the language itself says, use this in a case by case situation. Because one mile within the borders of on campus property for a school in a more urban setting might mean something very different than a campus in a more rural setting in terms of applicability and in terms of whether or not that would make sense to include statistics within that one mile border. Another question we get in relation to this, and Abby, feel free to jump in if you think you could um, flesh this out even further. But we've gotten a lot of questions around how this one mile rule, quote unquote rule, for reasonably contiguous impacts public property classification. Does it continue to push out the public property boundary one mile and one mile and one mile? The answer, the answer to that is no. Um, but the Department of Education has said that you could go either way in terms of how to apply public property classification in the sense of if you push out your boundary, that one mile from where it is now, and then you count anything within that one mile as part of your on-campus property, then there might be public property within that um, extension that would be then counted within your public property category now. Some instances, uh, sorry, so the Department of Education has also said, though, that in some instances you might choose to just count the public property that is immediately around the locations that are within one mile of your campus property uh, border. So you would not necessarily be extending the radius of your on-campus property as much as extending it out to a specific location. And at that location, you're just going to worry about the public property immediately around that location that happens to be within one mile of your borders of your campus, of your on-campus property. So you can choose which way you would like to classify your public property within that one mile extension. You could either choose to count all the public property within that extended radius, or you can choose to just count the public property immediately around the locations that you happen to own or control within one mile of your on-campus border. That, is, that can be admittedly you know, confusing or admittedly frustrating or something that might be difficult to translate to other individuals at your campus. So what we always recommend, as Abby has said before, just as we are not the enforcement authority of the Clery Act, if there are specific questions about how to classify a specific piece of your Clery geography, we recommend reaching out to WESTAP because they are in the best position to give you that more formal answer around specifics. We are more than happy to guide you through those general questions, but if you're looking for that confirmation from a more official source, we definitely recommend reaching out to them as they are in the best position to help you. A second question here that we are getting commonly, certainly um, now in light of the 2016 guidance, is around how to count or classify off-campus trips um, due to the guidance that was published in the 2016 version of the handbook. So a couple of pieces here. The guidance that's in the handbook did not just come out of thin air in June of 2016. It was actually guidance that had already been communicated to campuses by the Department of Education through a memo that was published through Westat a few years prior to that. But as that was not as widely circulated, perhaps, they found it would be, they felt it would be helpful to include it within the handbook itself. So my favorite pages of the handbook are 2-25 and 2-26 because they go over all of these considerations to take into account when you're thinking about whether or not you should be classifying off-campus trips within your Clery geography. 
So the piece here that's crucial to remember is what the, the Department of Education is being very clear on, is that if off-campus trips occur either for more than one night, and again, I should be clear, these are trips that we are talking about that are supporting the educational mission of the institution, um, that, that, is, that is very clear in what they are talking about here. We're not talking about any old trips that are taken, but these are you know, trips that are really frequented by students um, that support the educational mission of the institution. And they feel there are two different routes that you can go to meet the definition of repeated use or frequently used by students. One of those is any overnight trip of more than one night or any repeated use of a location, no matter how many nights you stay over. If it is the same location that you are going back to year after year after year, then that location, as well as the location that you spend more than one overnight at, would constitute that repeated use, that frequently used by students, which makes it part of your non-campus property, in which case you would then be collecting crime statistics information for the time that you are using that property um, for including those statistics within your non-campus reporting category. Study abroad is a little bit different because study abroad could not fall within your query geography at all. It could sit within this non-campus category because of these factors we're talking about here or it could be so far as to be a separate campus if it has that organized program of study and an administrative authority at that location itself. So those are the things to take into consideration and the things that we get a lot of questions about, particularly because as you all that do this work frequently start to share with your campus community what now we would have to start counting within our non-campus category, it can become overwhelming. Some folks could feel that that is overstating what the guidance is intending. Um, and, I, and I know a lot of that really has come up around trips around athletics in particular because that, that would meet probably both of these criteria in terms of being a trip of more than one night or the repeated use of a location. And that's just a lot. That's a lot of data. That's a lot of locations. So we totally understand that that could be a little bit uh, overwhelming to tackle and it might be difficult to translate or communicate to your campus community. So what I recommend is really utilizing that handbook that from 225 to 226 as that outlines those specific areas. And what we are highlighting in a couple of slides, if we have not already, is that we have a couple of tools in that files pod that refer to geography um, a little bit more. One of them is your understanding statistics document, which goes through what is and is not captured through your query statistics in general. We'll reference that document again when we get to counting and classifying. Um, but before we get to the second resource, I did want to highlight um, a quick poll that we're going to ask you all to take. And so this poll is asking if your institution already uses a query geography map. So just take a second to answer yes or no. You can answer just by clicking on the button next to yes or no, and that will submit your answer. I do see a question that has come through the chat box um, asking around if supporting educational mission, um, if athletics programs, it seems to be questioning whether or not athletics trips would be counted as supporting the educational mission of the institution. Um, as many of the examples provided within the handbook do reference athletic trips or athletic tournaments, I would say that the Department of Education definitely considers um, trips taken in support of athletics to be constituting as that supporting the educational mission of the institution, yes. Abby, I don't know if you would add anything to that. No, I wouldn't. Okay. So I see as we're getting some answers in for this poll, yes, this seems to be about 68% of you do currently use the Clery Geography Map. That is so exciting to hear. I know that this is a little off topic, but we would love to see examples of the types of maps that you all are using and how you maybe got to that process, how you developed that map, and how you have found it to be successful in terms of communicating about Cleary geography with your campus community. So if you are ever um, interested in sharing that information with the Cleary Center, I know we would be happy to receive it. Or if any of you even want to link to your own Cleary geography map in the chat box right now, I know other institutions would really um, appreciate getting some visuals on how other institutions have developed that tool. And so in that same vein, what we're talking about in this slide when we talk about these featured resources, one of them is a Cleary geography map project plan, and that document is in that files pod that we've been talking about right below your slide. That project plan is a how-to guide for developing a committee or a group 
that would compose and execute and publish a query geography map for your campus. So it gives you a step-by-step -step guide as to what to take into consideration in terms of composition of the group itself and the actual tasks of the group in order to get that goal accomplished. So if you feel like that would be a project that you would all like to take on at your institution, please reference that tool as we feel like it is a very helpful one in guiding you through that process. But now I think I will toss it back to Abby, who's going to address some frequently asked questions around counting and classifying crime. Great, and I want to just address one of the geography questions that came in while you were talking. Um, would an online university that has no students coming to a campus but has a veteran center where students may visit, would that be considered on campus? So there is a section of the handbook, so I'll point you to pages 1-3 um, to 1-4 of the Handbook for Campus Safety and Security Reporting that talks about um, exemptions to um, Cleary compliance, and it does talk about distance education only institutions. And the language that it uses is, if your institution is a distance education only school and your students are never present on a physical campus, you do not have to comply with the requirements discussed in this handbook. This means that students do not go to a physical location to enroll, seek guidance, study, work, intern, et cetera. The only exception to this rule is an annual graduation ceremony. If the only time students are present on a physical campus is to attend a graduation ceremony at a location that your institution owns or controls, your institution is still exempt from compliance. So your specific question was a little bit broader than that because it certainly didn't address graduation, it addressed other services. Um, so while it seems like that concept could be broadened to the Veterans Center, we would still recommend reaching out to Westat with the specific circumstances of your institution just to make sure that that's the case because um, as is always the case, um, during a webinar or this type of format, there might be specifics to your institution that we don't have context for um, and Westat would be the best um, or is in the role to be able to respond to those types of questions. But hopefully that helps direct you to where some of the existing guidance is in that area. The other one is if the university is the operating manager for a city-owned airport and has a flight center at that airport, is the entire airport Cleary property. Um, so what I would recommend is to look at um, the institution, or excuse me, to look at the handbook. There's a number of different, uh, there's a section that talks about some of these um, properties that are owned or controlled and the purposes as to how they're being used. Because it sounds like although the university is the operating manager for that particular airport, um, it may or may not be, um, that entire airport may or may not be used for educational purposes. So some of that might be more specific to how it's being used. We could certainly unpack that a little bit um, more separately on a one-on-one -on -one call if that's helpful. We do provide technical assistance in that way, um, so we can talk about that. But there are sections of the handbook that also speak more to um, the circumstances that many of your institutions might have where your institution um, owns or controls property, some of which may not be um, for the use of your institution or those educational purposes. So if you'd like to unpack that more um, separately for the individual who asked that question, um, our contact information is provided. I believe within the slides, we can also put them in this um, chat box as well so that we can do that. I'm going to move on to counting and classifying questions. Please do feel free to uh, continue asking questions within the chat box. We just want to make sure that we get through the core content of the webinar. We'll use the remaining um, time, any time that we have left over, to address some of these specific questions if we're able to. So for counting and classifying, um, just as a reminder, as, as we mentioned a little bit earlier, the Clery Act does apply to specific types of crime. So we talked about campus security authorities um, and mentioned how those campus security authorities are required to report when um, someone discloses to them that certain types of um, crimes have occurred. But um, Cleary also is, is um, specific as to what crimes must be reported. And it puts those crimes into what you see labeled here as kind of four buckets. So criminal offenses, which include criminal homicide, um, murder and non-negligent manslaughter, and manslaughter by negligence. Sexual assault, which includes rape, fondling, incest, and statutory rape. Robbery, aggravated assault, burglary, motor vehicle theft, and arson. 
Um, it also includes the category of hate crimes, which would be any of the um, types of incidents I just mentioned, and any incidents of larceny, theft, simple assault, intimidation, or destruction, damage, or vandalism of property that were motivated by bias. Um, VAWA offenses, which are the offenses that were included within the um, Violence Against Women Act amendments to the Clery Act, domestic violence, stadium violence, and stalking. And then arrests and referrals for disciplinary action for liquor law violations, drug law violations, and weapons offenses. And the reason why we always reinforce um, Clery crimes is because you might have um, state and local jurisdictional definitions that are different than these federal Clery crime definitions. So when you are reporting for your own crime statistics within your annual security report, that must be um, using those Cleary crime definitions as your basis for determining whether a Cleary crime was reported in your Cleary specific geography, that geography that Laura was just discussing, um, and that would be what's captured within your statistics. It would be counted in the year that the crime was reported, not the year that the crime occurred. So that's something to really take into consideration and something that sometimes presents a challenge for institutions. Um, so as you're revisiting your own reporting processes, making sure that those um, statistics that are reflected within your annual security report are those for the offenses that were reported in that particular year. So say an incident was reported in 2016, even though it occurred in 2014, it would be accounted within those 2016 statistics. So for some of our common um, areas, uh, one of the, the pieces that we hear quite a bit is uh, related to hate crime um, counting. How can we be sure when we're looking at um, uh, considering hate crimes or information that's provided to us, how can we make sure that it falls under Clery reporting? So the first thing certainly to consider is, um, as I mentioned, the institution has to report for specific types of hate crimes um, that, or those incidents that were motivated by bias within the crimes categories that I um, referred to earlier, but it's also for specific types of bias. So those areas would be race, religion, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, ethnicity, national origin, and disability. And so what we would really um, remind you of and reinforce is that there's language in the handbook, and this is in Chapter 3, um, a lot of the information that we're um, referencing here starts on page 30. And it pulls from the hate crime um, data collection guidelines um, through um, the Federal um, Bureau of Investigation um, and the training manual that they provide. And essentially what it does is it breaks down some of these examples. So when we get the question of what might be considered evidence of a biased motivation, we really point to that list. And the handbook itself mentions that it um, might not be a comprehensive list, that there could be, certainly be a number of different um, case-specific um, pieces of evidence that, that you might see when encountering an incident. But it talks about things such as um, whether there were bias-related um, comments or statements or gestures that were made by the offender, um, were there bias-related relating drawings or markings or symbol? Is it the anniversary of a specific holiday or event? Um, were there certain objects or items that might indicate bias that were used for the incident? Um, was that offender previously involved in a similar hate crime um, or as a hate crime member? Um, were there indications that a specific hate group was involved? So um, what were some of the indicators there? Is there um, a historical knowledge, so to speak? So has um, this individual or um, has this specific group established animosity between the victim um, and the offender's group? So it does go down a list. So we would, one, point you to that section of the handbook and certainly the overarching hate crime data collection um, guidelines and training manual. But I think our bigger takeaway, too, um, for this particular piece is that your reporting is coming from campus security authorities, not just police and security. So it does go back to the conversation that we started a little bit earlier around training, which is do members of your community, one, recognize that hate crime reporting is an aspect of Cleary reporting, and two, would they know to include this additional detail when they're making their report to you so that you or, and by you I mean whatever, um, individual or department is making this, um, this classification for your institution 
do you have the data that's available um, to make that determination? Um, because that documentation, both what the CSA provides to you and how you document your knowledge of the incident, is what you're going to use to classify um, whether or not that incident was a hate crime. So we always encourage in our trainings and beyond, um, if there are members of your community that are responsible for this classification that haven't gone through um, a specific training on hate crimes, the nature of hate crimes, classifying hate crimes, we really would recommend that to be an area we do not purport to be experts um, in, in all areas of hate crime reporting. So we would recommend that members of your community that are going to be making this determination um, do get additional training in that area so that you are best prepared um, and, and able to, to document and to respond certainly to those incidents if and when they occur. Another um, separate area, but certainly a, a common one that we see in here related to classifying and counting crimes is in relation to those drug, alcohol, and weapons violation referrals. I know we were answering a couple of questions actually in some of the private Q&A in this area, um, so I imagine it might be coming up for others that are on this line as well. Um, and a common theme especially is in relation to the decriminalization of, of marijuana in certain states. So one thing to, that we want to reinforce in this area is that your arrests and referrals for drug law violations, liquor law violations, and weapons offenses do have to be just that. There has to be a law violation. So you certainly might have policy violations for a number of things um, within your institution, and probably the um, best example, most clear example, is um, in relation to alcohol. There are a number of campuses where um, they might be a dry campus, so even if you are over the age of 21, um, that individuals are not permitted to be um, drinking within a residence hall or in other locations on the campus. That would be an example of something that's a policy violation, but not a law violation, because if that person is of age, if they're over 21, um, they would be permitted to drink. So. We use that, I use that as an example to reinforce that for an incident to be collected and to be counted within your statistics, there must be that underlying law violation um, to be reflected. That doesn't necessarily mean that you wouldn't have other policy violations, that there wouldn't be a disciplinary process for these other instances that are a violation of campus policy. They just wouldn't be collected within your statistics. The other thing we um, wanted to highlight is in relation to that decriminalization of marijuana because it's very important that you're paying attention to the language of decriminalized um, because every state tends to be um, different in terms of the terminology they use and what it actually means. So some states, for example, will say that there's um, a decriminalization or um, that conduct was decriminalized but in reality, it's still considered to be a law violation. It's just a lesser offense. Um, so we would go back to that language in the handbook that says um, that it must mean that the conduct is no longer a criminal offense in order for it to truly be considered, quote, unquote, decriminalized and therefore something that would not be counted within your statistics. If that is not the case, if there is still a law violation in relation um, to that, what's labeled as decriminalization for your institution, it would typically still be counted within your statistics. The only reason I use the terminology of typically is that every state tends to be very, very different with this. Um, I know that Westat, when we've um, talked with them, they're getting a lot of different questions where they have to give very state-specific answers based on what your own um, state law says. So if you do have questions related to that, it goes back to one of the themes that Laura said earlier in talking about geography. She noted that our geography decisions are decisions that we should be making so that when a crime is reported, we shouldn't be, have to ask, is this location a part of Cleary geography because we already know? And I would say the same for this. We don't want to raise the question of, oh, now that this incident has occurred, is it Cleary reportable? We want to know what offenses, what definitions are Cleary reportable so that we're just reflecting and recording that appropriately. So before we move on from there, Laura, is there anything that you would add or expand on with that or any um, questions? I know you've been really great at responding within the chat box. Any questions that you think is helpful to highlight here before we move on to timely warning and emergency notification? No, I think um, I would not add anything and I would not draw attention to any other questions that came through. There weren't really many about counting and classifying. 
Great, thank you. Sure. So thank you so much, Abby. I will now, as Abby just said, uh, talk a little bit more about timely warnings and emergency notification as another topic area. And so some fast facts in this area. This is something that we do see frequently, um, but it's, no, it's by no means a recent, just a recent concern. Um, there is a need to always reemphasize that timely warnings and emergency notifications are separate and distinct alerting systems or requirements under the Clery Act. And as such, they have separate uses, separate intentions, and separate criteria by which you would um, utilize them. And so we'll talk through how those things are separate and distinct a little bit here, and then talk about some frequently asked questions around the application of timely warnings and emergency notifications. So timely warnings are specifically used when Cleary crimes and Cleary geography are found to pose a serious or ongoing threat to the campus community. And they must be issued to your entire campus community, including information about the nature of the incident itself and, and essentially what is causing it to be a, a timely warning, what is that serious or ongoing threat. And then it should provide some information to the campus community about what to do in terms of how to report if they are also the victim of that crime and what to do to avoid being the victim of the crime that has caused the timely warning to be issued. Um, to borrow some language from our executive director, Allison Kiss, Timely warnings are not to put people in the know. They are to really make you aware of what is going on on campus. And sometimes that um, distinction is not always clear for the campus community. And this is an area that I, I know it's easier said than done, but we always at Cleary Center advocate for as much awareness as you could possibly do around what the intention of a timely warning is um, with your campus community. And that really um, is important because sometimes a campus community can think that those timely warnings are intended to just be informing the campus community about when any Cleary Act crime occurs or when any crime occurs. And so if they become aware of the fact that a crime does occur and a timely warning does not go out, that could be misinterpreted as a, uh, an attempt by the institution to suppress that information or not share that information with the campus community. So the more that you can educate your campus community about the intention of that timely warning is really to be used in specific instances to prevent the occurrence of a similar crime, the better it will be for your campus community to understand um, the, the function of those and so as to not dilute the intensity of that message. Going along with that, there is a lot of guidance within the handbook around making sure that you are issuing those timely warnings on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and we'll touch on that a little bit in a couple of slides as well. Um, in addition to timely warnings, so you do have emergency notifications as a separate sort of alert that a campus should use. And those should be used for when any incident on your core campus, so on campus, um, occurs that poses a significant emergency to your campus. Um, so th that does not have to be a query crime. It can truly be any occurrence that is an emergency. Some examples of what would fall under that category would be an active shooter or a chemical spill or even a significant weather emergency. Um, and that notification can be segmented. So that does not need to go to your entire campus community. That message can only be sent to those that are directly impacted by that emergency should that group not be your entire campus community. So you can see that you know, emergency notifications are used for in a little bit broader sense, but to a very specific group of people, whereas timely warnings are sent to your entire campus community for a very specific reason. And that is, again, those Cleary crimes occurring within Cleary geography that pose a serious or ongoing threat to the campus community. So when we talk about um, these two types of alerts, a common question we do get is then how do you make that determination of there is a serious or ongoing threat and therefore your institution uh, needs to send a timely warning? So I'm going to reference a couple of tools here that I'd like you to use. One is just the language itself in Chapter 6 of the handbook on pages 613 and 614 provides some things to take into consideration when making that case-by-case -case analysis of issuing a timely warning. The Department of Education really likes to highlight that there should never be a blanket application of timely warnings, meaning, you know, if this situation, then we always send a timely warning. Just because, again, that kind of mis, um, misinterprets and misfocuses the intention of the timely warning, both for your campus and for the institution, and dilutes the message, possibly unintentionally. And so using that case-by-case -case basis is a really helpful um, criteria to determine whether or not you should be issuing that timely warning. 
So some factors to consider are listed on those pages, again, 613 and 614 in the handbook. And there's some rather obvious things, you know, the nature of the crime itself, what actually is happening, what the continuing danger to the campus community looks like, if there is any risk to law enforcement or risk to a law enforcement investigation, if you were to make any sort of notification about this incident. But then going even a couple of steps further, we um, are sharing a document in the files pod called our Timely Warning Matrix, which is um, a document that we put together to collaboration with a couple of different folks at other institutions that we are including as part of our new um, Clery Act training curriculum that we are launching in 2018. And so this is a little bit of a preview for you all to um, be able to see some of the things that we'll be talking through and how we'll be talking through the application of Clery Act um, requirements in greater detail with our new training. But this template, if you open it up right now and act, access it, it references many other factors to consider or that you can consider in determining if a serious and ongoing threat may exist. This is a helpful exercise to use for any Cleary crime occurring within Cleary geography, even if you know you would never send a timely warning for it, as it really could help your folks that are in the position to make this decision more and more comfortable with having to consider these factors. So some things that are listed on this document are, you know, the suspect is known to the victim or not, um, the suspect is not in custody, if there are multiple victims, if the victim is under the age of 18, if there appears to be an isolated incident with a specifically targeted victim, or if there's a pattern of behavior around campus. And it's, it's definitely, there is no um, formula on this matrix, such as if, you know, seven or more of these factors are checked, then issue the timely warning. It truly is still, you know, it could be one of these factors is enough to issue a timely warning or all. It really, that would be something that your campus would need to make a determination with, and it would also matter as to the context of the entire situation. But nonetheless, these factors are still really helpful ones to use in making that determination of whether or not the serious or ongoing threat occurs. And then a second question that we get frequently is, you know, what language can be used in a timely warning to describe the location of an incident but still maintain victim confidentiality? This is a very, very specific question, so we'll talk about it, but we'll also talk about the more general concept here, which is what language is helpful to include in a timely warning? What are some things that we should be using? What are some things we should avoid? Um, so to answer this question, the Department of Education has said specifically, while you do need to have a location, you can be general in that location information, um, but not so general that it actually is not helpful. So for example, and Abby, feel free to echo in um, here if you would like to add anything. Um, but for example, if an incident is reported to take place within a residence hall room, um, some could make the argument that if you only have three residence halls on campus, naming that residence hall might cause the identity of the victim to no longer be considered confidential. So there might be ways in which you could still indicate that it took place in a residence hall on campus, but maybe not name that exact floor or room number or, or even residence hall at all if you don't think that would be helpful, but still noting that it took place in a residence hall. It would not be enough in that situation to just say that it took place on campus. That is, not, um, that is too general and not specific enough for what Ed, for what Ed is looking for here. Um, additionally, when you're taking into consideration what language to put in your timely warnings in general, um, we worked, um, we not worked, but we had the University of Wisconsin-Madison participate in a National Campus Safety Awareness Month webinar a couple of years ago, um, sharing a process that they went through on their campus involving their campus community in a series of town hall meetings to talk through some issues they had around um, trauma-informed language not being really present in a lot of the different things that they were using to communicate about incidents on their campus, one of which was timely warnings. And so the result of that town hall was getting a lot of community feedback about language that would be more helpful to include within timely warnings when it comes to that section on providing information as to how to avoid becoming um, a victim of a similar crime. And so where you see in that files pod, if you scroll down, you'll see the document that is called Fall 2017 UW-Madison Sexual Assault Prevention Tips. And if you click on that link, it'll open up to a Word document of the most recently updated version of the language that UW-Madison uses when they are issuing timely warnings um, in terms of taking into consideration what is most helpful to include. And you'll see within that document they talk through some general language um, that is not victim blaming about what happens around a sexual assault 
and what is helpful to know uh, when you are reporting about a sexual assault, whether as a victim or as a witness. And then encourages information as to how to not be a perpetrator of sexual assault, in addition to information around bystander intervention and what you can do if you are um, a witness to or a third party um, that is privy to information about a sexual assault. So we hope that that document, in addition to that timely warning decision matrix, are two that are really helpful in addressing some of these common questions around issuing timely warnings specifically. Um, Abby, I don't know if you wanted to address any questions that came through in that section before we pass on to VAWA, or if you had anything else you wanted to add around alerting. No, I didn't have um, anything to add uh, from the questions. A lot of the private Q&A that are coming in right now are still around geography or some of the other areas. Um, the only thing that I would highlight and reinforce that when it comes to timely warnings, and, and Laura did a great job of, of really acknowledging this, it really is a case-by-case -case, um, analysis and assessment. So um, even as we talked about a little bit earlier in the webinar, what information is publicly identifiable for one party could be different for another party depending on kind of the nature of their identities um, and the specifics of the case. So that's where it's really important to think about um, this issue broadly to have a conversation ahead of time so that members that are making that analysis have an understanding of what information could potentially be identifiable um, and to really establish your process for making the case-by-case -case analysis and documenting. Um, and thank you to Katie for reinforcing that, um, that sample document, that sample timely warning matrix is in the files um, to reinforce some of what Laura said. So thank you for that. So, for this last section, before we move on to just the final um, areas around um, the VAWA amendments and any lingering questions, um, we did have a poll for the timely warning template language. And did we get to launch that already? Okay, perfect. Um, so my colleague uh, Amy is um, working to launch that just so we can get a sense from all of you as to whether or not um, you're actually using that structure on your campus. So have these conversations already had um, been had on, on your campus related to what templates you need? And thinking about that broadly, I, I know we're talking um, here, we did talk here around campus sexual assault, but even considering some of these other incidents that might impact our campus community related to hate crimes or other crimes against person, um, where certainly we have to, to be conscious of how the language we're using reinforces whether or not members of our community feel comfortable coming forward. So I'm just going to give a couple more moments for that poll to go through. Okay, so it looks like, um, as we close the poll, it looks like there's about a mix. So um, a few more um, say yes as opposed to no. So 53% versus 46% say no. Um, so for those of you who, who did say um, that you have template language, that's great. Um, and really, you know, again, as we mentioned earlier, we find peer sharing to be incredibly useful. Um, so although we're not going to take a, a copy and paste fully from other institutions, this might be a space where you might want to connect with and share with other others um, participating in National Campus Safety Awareness Month to get some ideas or strategies or thoughts as to what's been useful and helpful for them. And for those of you that don't have templates, it's something to take back to um, your campus or uh, ideally a Clery compliance team if you have, if you have it. Um, one of the things that we find incredibly helpful when working with Clery compliance teams is to have some of these specific goals or tasks that the team is working towards so that all the different members, although they're from different departments, um, really feel as though they um, regularly know why they're part of the team and what those overarching goals are. So um, some of these tasks can be really useful to help keep those multiple parties engaged. So for the last section, we're going to look at the Violence Against Women Act amendments to the Clery Act and some of the, the common areas here. We referenced them a little bit earlier. So these are the amendments that took place in 2013. They added to and expanded the Campus Sexual Assault um, Victims Bill of Rights. Uh, that was put in place in 1992 that provided specific rights and options to victims of campus sexual assault. So the expansion um, uh, really afforded additional rights to survivors of not only sexual assault but also domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking. And not only expanded what's available but also the many resources that your community provides. 
So in addition to adding statistics for dating violence, domestic violence, and stalking, it also um, added gender identity and separated national origin um, and ethnicity as bias categories that you're considering for hate crime classification, as we discussed a little bit earlier. Um, it, and it also requires institutions to have certain elements uh, within their prevention um, program their response protocols, as well as their disciplinary procedures for students and employees. Uh, one resource that we'll point you to, um, and we can find it and, and link it here, um, is we do have a Violence Against Women Act Amendments to Cleary checklist available on the Cleary Center website, so we can dig that up and, um, and share that with all of you. Because for this, we're only talking about certain common questions, but we know that that's an area where a lot of institutions are doing quite a bit of development of their own policies and procedures. So that's a good resource to go back to as you're making sure that your campus has addressed all of the necessary policy requirements. So we're going to dig into a very specific aspect of prevention here, um, because one of the things that we hear are what are examples of language you can use or tips to include in prevention programming that represent the Cleary definition of risk reduction. And we wanted to highlight that here because although your prevention requirements for sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking do include specific elements within a prevention policy. Um, this one tends to be maybe a new area of development for some campuses. So many campuses before this point really didn't have a policy driving prevention efforts. Um, but two, Cleary uses the phrase risk reduction in a very different way than maybe some of us might historically think of risk reduction. So um, the definition for Cleary includes options designed to decrease perpetration um, and bystander in action to increase empowerment for victims in order to promote safety and to help individuals and communities address the conditions that facilitate violence. So when you are in your policies talking about um, risk reduction and then describing what your risk reduction programs look like in relation to programs for students and employees um, for sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking, your primary prevention and awareness programs, make sure that your language that you're using really does keep that definition in mind. So that would be um, incorporating elements of bystander intervention. So if risk reduction per Cleary is addressing bystander inaction, one way that your risk reduction programs might address that is by tackling those barriers within programming. So looking at what might stand in the way of someone feeling as though they can intervene, and we know that that can be a number of different things, um, sometimes even just an understanding of what bystander intervention looks like. Individuals might assume that that means that they have to go and confront a person themselves in order for it to be bystander intervention. So one way you might address that barrier, address bystander inaction, is by giving them alternate strategies for bystander intervention, whether it's engaging other individuals, um, whether it's making a report to another party, um, a number of others that I know you all um, are incorporated and using on your campuses. Um, when we're thinking about options designed to decrease perpetration, many of you are doing um, consent education and talking to members of your community as to what consent looks like and means um, and how that translates into their own interactions within the community. So um, that in itself would be risk reduction. When we're looking at empowering um, uh, increasing empowerment for victims. There might be a number of different resources that you have on campus um, to empower individuals to get the support and assistance from others if they feel as though they're at risk. Um, or you might have other types of uh, programs that can empower um, individuals to feel safe and security within their own environment. So we wanted to include this here to really um, call to attention that language and to reframe how you're thinking about risk reduction and also how you're integrating that risk reduction into your own programming policy and into certainly the programs themselves. That doesn't mean necessarily that you have to start everything from scratch. You may have a number of existing programs that fit this definition. But as you're doing that analysis, you really want to consider um, whether or not what you're looking at as risk reduction actually meets the risk reduction definition via Cleary. Um, there's another resource on the NACSAM, the National Campus Safety Awareness Month website, um, that talks about how you organize your prevention programs and um, prevention information. Um, so that might be a good resource to refer to as you're thinking about this particular area. Laura, is there anything that you would add about that resource before we move on to the written information requirements? No, I think you covered it all, Abby.
Perfect. And then the um, second to last piece we wanted to address here is in related to written information provided within your community. Because as we're doing, you know, one, one thing that we do um, with Cleary Center members is we do annual security report reviews. And a common pattern that we're seeing um, is missing information within the institution's policy statements related to these requirements which isn't to say that institutions aren't doing them, but if they are, they're not always communicating them within their annual security reports. So there are a couple of pieces in which, uh, places in which the institution must provide written information to members of their community. One is written information about on and off campus resources that's provided to all students and employees. And those resources include a number of different areas um, related to health and advocacy um, and, and many other areas within the requirement. And so we wanted to remind you that one, um, that document is a requirement under Clery, and two, that that information is provided to all students and employees. So although you have some resources that are provided just to um, an individual when they report, that information about your on and off campus services and all of the required areas, financial um, and otherwise, must be um, provided to all of your students and employees. An additional resource is a written explanation of rights and options to victims. And essentially, that's a drilled down version of your policy. It's not intended to be handing over the annual security report or the policy itself to the person reporting, but rather a handout that takes some of this complex information and turns it into a handout that um, gives a high-level overview about all of these different areas. So um, procedures that an individual might um, follow if they unfortunately are a victim of sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking. Reporting options, the option to report to law enforcement or decline to report. Um, uh, options available related to protection from abuse orders or other um, related orders such as no contact orders. Information related to how to access the institution's disciplinary process and those disciplinary procedures. Um, and a number of different areas. Um, so we'd really encourage you to think about, one, what is our process for providing this written explanation to victims um, when they make a report, making sure that it does go broader than just providing them with a policy or the annual security report, making sure that those documents do exist on your campus, and then thinking about what is our process then for sharing when that report um, does come in and how we communicated that within our annual security report. So it's not just something that we do in practice, but that it's captured within our policy and then reflected within the policy statement in the annual security report itself. And then that, last but not least, for disciplinary procedures. Um, so this is an area where we know institutions are struggling a bit in how they take what uh, may be, um, maybe not complicated, but certainly lengthy um, processes and best represent them within the annual security report. We would really recommend um, or uh, advise against just cutting and pasting policies. And the reason for that is the Clery Act requires you to uh, um, disclose specific elements of your disciplinary procedures, um, describing information such as sanctions that are imposed, the different steps that are involved, and how someone can make a complaint in both student and employee, um, related to both student and employee procedures. And what can happen if you're cutting and pasting policies is that you, one, might um, omit or forget certain pieces that are required um, as part of your Clery Act reporting, but more often what we see is the information um, is sometimes confusing or bulky and unhelpful in the way that it's shared in the annual security report. So you want to make sure that you have all the necessary information for so the processes for both students and employees and the detail that's needed for your timelines, your sanctions, your steps. Um, again, all of this is captured in the VAWA amendments um, checklist that um, my colleague Amy um, linked within the chat box. But you, we do recommend and um, we hope that institutions will take into consideration how they can be intentional around those disciplinary procedures. So if I'm reading your annual security report, um, would I have an understanding if I'm a student or an employee, um, how I would file a complaint and what that process would look like if I do choose to move forward with disciplinary procedures? Because we know that when someone comes forward, when they're part of the campus community, they might choose to report to law enforcement, they might um, choose to report 
through the disciplinary procedures at the institution. They might choose to access both at the same time or neither or just one or the other. Um, so that's why the goal of these particular requirements is to make those processes clear so that individuals feel as though they have enough information to determine whether or not that's something they would like to access or um, choose to do at the campus. So, that captures our um, overview of some of the common questions that we are seeing right now. Um, thank you to all of you that were contributing your own questions as we were going along. We also appreciate many of you were reaching out um, in the private Q&A um, for some um, maybe very specific questions that you didn't think translated or were necessarily relevant to others um, within the webinar. So we appreciate your um, consideration related to that. But I'm looking to see if there are any other questions coming in as we have our last few minutes. But in the meantime, um, Laura, Mike, is there anything else that you would want to contribute or share um, as we close out the webinar? No, I don't think so. Just um, that that query staff fact document, in addition to all of the tools you've been referencing in the webinar, are available in that files pod. And many of them can also be found on our NACSAM website under resources. Great. Mike, is there anything that you would like to add or share? He may be muted, but I will take that as a no for now. So you'll notice that our colleague um, Amy uh, put a link within the chat. That uh, is a evaluation for this webinar. We always use our evaluations to inform what we provide in the future. It's a really great space to let us know what was helpful, if there was additional information that you were looking for, and we certainly use them to craft other learning opportunities, not just for National Campus Safety Awareness Month, but throughout the year. Um, so please do take some time to fill out that evaluation. Um, and as we mentioned um, earlier, this webinar was recorded, so we will make sure to share that recording within next week's um, email for National Campus Safety Awareness Month. If you are not signed up to receive those emails for National Campus Safety Awareness Month or you're um, interested and you want to make sure that you are accessing the other information, you can go to the Cleary Center website, www.clearycenter.org, and again, link to the NACSAM website itself, which is NACSAM, um, N-C-S-A-M, dot clearycenter.org. Um, so thank you to all of you who um, joined us for today's webinar and especially your patience for those of you who were having some issues with the join link um, and with the technology. Please do feel free to reach out to the Cleary Center with any other additional questions or concerns that might be coming up for your campus. You'll see our contact information is on the screen there. We do provide technical assistance not just for National Campus Safety Awareness Month but throughout the year and we appreciate all your attention to this work. Laura, is there anything else that you would add as we close out? No, thank you so much, um, Abby, and thanks so much to Code Blue and Mike, and thank you to everybody that participated today. Thank you. Have a great afternoon.